There are not a lot of examples of perfection in life, except in the world of sports. On rare and exciting nights, a baseball pitcher can throw a perfect game or a basketball player can have a perfect night shooting. But a perfect career, that's the rarest of accomplishments. Today's guest recounts the life of Rocky Marciano, who finished his heavyweight championship career with a perfect 49-0 record. He's Mike Stanton, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selvey Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, filmmakers, authors, journalists, and more, to make sense of the big stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Mike Stanton, a veteran journalist, professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut, and author of Unbeaten, a new biography of legendary boxer Rocky Marciano. Mike, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Jim. So we want to talk to you about Unbeaten, but we want to start a little bit earlier in your career, too. One of your, uh, uh, your, your previously had published The Prince of Providence, the true story of Buddy Cianci, America's most notorious mayors, some wise guys in the feds, which is a <laughs> sort of a fascinating read about uh, uh, the history of, of, of uh, the leadership of the city of Providence. Um, how did you come to, 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 to get to know Buddy Cianci and cover him? I ran the investigative reporting team at the Providence Journal, Rhode Island's leading newspaper, uh, for many years. And you can't cover corruption and crime in Rhode Island without coming across Buddy Cianci in my day. He was the longest serving mayor in Providence history, but more interestingly, he had a national reputation. Um, he was a guy who was a lovable rogue. He was a modern day Huey Long. Um, I called it, you know, like a soprano-like character. Um, and he really embodied a lot of American politics, just as Rhode Island and Providence um, in its, you know, foundation in the colonial era embodies a lot of the American uh, tradition. So I thought, you know, my philosophy of writing books is, you know, all history is biography. And you find the right person and you can tell a story about a time and a place and history and politics and immigration and uh, and a very colorful character. In he, he was sort of, he was colorful and he was beloved in, 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 in large parts of Providence. Mm -hmm. um, is there, is, does his, uh, does the phenomena of Buddy Cianci in Providence give us any insight into the phenomena of Donald Trump nationally? Yes, I mean, Buddy was, was someone who could command the spotlight, defy the facts, and win people's adoration in spite of his flaws. I mean, here's a man who was mayor two separate occasions. The first time, three dozen of his uh, aides went to prison. He escaped prison because they wouldn't rat him out. And the second time, he ultimately went to prison in a racketeering case. And, we, and when he went to prison, the judge who sentenced him compared him to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Buddy, being Buddy, told his hairdresser, well, how come I didn't get two effing paychecks? <laughs> <laughs> and that certainly speaks to the colorful nature of his character. Prince of Providence was a best-selling book. The stories that you did for the Providence Journal were incredibly well-read. Uh, doesn't that speak to more than simply your book and the audience for the Providence Journal in, in terms of America's fascination with crime itself. Yes, crime and corruption. Buddy is this lovable rogue. You know, you go back to, you know, Huey Long and James Michael Curley, and Buddy was, was in that tradition. And here's a guy who gave a, a speech at the Republican National Convention. He was friends with Gerald Ford. He was an ethnic urban Italian Republican mayor in the Northeast, and that gave him a lot of cachet in the 70s. And some people uh, thought that he could have had a bright future in the United States Senate, but he could never quite escape the sewers of Providence and the corruption and the ethnic machine politics of the city and, and the organized crime influence. And it ultimately dragged him down. And so it was a great Shakespearean tragedy. Don't Americans sort of have a love-hate relationship with criminals? I mean, we love to read 
about them. You were involved in Mark Smirling's Crime Town podcast. We yes. had Mark as a guest on the show. So we love to read those stories, but we hate what many of them have done because they do despicable things, many of them. And talk about that, the love-hate relationship that American audiences have with their criminals. Well, when Buddy went to prison, uh, people did a public opinion poll, and most people thought he was guilty, but most people thought he had done a good job as mayor. And that contradiction in our political system, I think, you know, goes back to the days of Roger Williams when he founded Providence on this idea of religious freedom and tolerance, but with it came a lot of roguish behavior and a lot of cutting corners. You know, Rhode Island was the center of the uh, colonial slave trade. Um, later, Rhode Island was the uh, birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution with plans that were smuggled out of England uh, by Samuel Slater. Intellectual property theft. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and then the later... And Rogue's Island, too, yeah. of course. Yes, yeah. Rogue's Isle. Cotton Mather called it the sewer of New England. And, of course, later Lincoln Steffens called it a state for sale and cheap. And we were, the, you know, with that Industrial Revolution came all the immigration that transformed America. Um, and so Rhode Island is really a great microcosm of a lot of forces in our history. In American history. In our American history yeah, and politics exactly. and culture. So, so backing up for a second, you had mentioned uh, that you had led the Providence Journal's investigative unit. Mm -hmm. How did you get there? Well, I grew, actually grew up outside of Hartford, and I always loved telling stories. You know, I remember writing stories in a you know Indian tablet notebook when I was a kid, and journalism was a way to make a living telling stories. And I gravitated to that, and eventually I came to Providence, and I initially was a sports writer, and then I, I had had some news experience, and a s series of circumstances uh, shifted me over to the investigative team during a big uh, scandal. And, and I loved it. And I, I always joke that I went from covering uh, sports to Rhode Island's leading sport, politics and corruption. <laughs> <laughs> so was, was that a factor in you deciding to write about Rocky Marciano, your latest? Absolutely. Sport? Rocky Marciano, history's only unbeaten heavyweight champion. Um, I didn't come to this as a boxing book. I actually came to it uh, through Buddy Cianci, partly, in researching his life. He grew up in the 1940s and the 1950s in Providence. He, um, his father would take him to fights at the old Rhode Island Auditorium where Rocky Marciano from nearby Brockton, Massachusetts was the headliner. And it was a very colorful era of guys and dolls and gangsters and politicians and working class folks. And, and the boxing ring was really a prism for America in the middle of the 20th century. You know, the country was changing in post-war America. People were working in factories. Um, it was a, a ring where immigrants would fight out their identities and people could be individuals in an increasingly industrialized society. And so it was just a very colorful era to me, you know, Rocky fighting in the smoke-filled Rhode Island Auditorium and the bookies in the back and the wise guys and the, the whispers of fixed fights. And then later, you know, he goes on to fight in Madison Square Garden and Yankee Stadium in this Damon Runyon era. Uh, when boxing was at the center of American life and identity. And you knew what was going on, even if you were only a casual fan, because if you were the heavyweight champion of the world, everybody knew your name. And you were friends with presidents and kings and movie stars. And Rocky was friends with Frank Sinatra, Marilyn Monroe, Jerry Lewis. Wow. Um, he actually, Jackie Gleason asked him to train him uh, for his movie role in The Hustler. But then he couldn't go through Rocky's workout regimen, so he, just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he went back to New York. I guess and, if you ever saw Jackie Gleason. Yeah. So, so you, you, you explain that um, becoming heavyweight champion of the world is not something you might have predicted about a young Rocky Marciano. Tell us a little bit about that. Rocky was five foot ten. He had short, stubby arms. He was awkward. He didn't have any grace. He started boxing late uh, for a boxer in his mid twenties. And within six years, you know, he fought an amateur fight in Brockton where he went to his uncle's house, ate a big dish of pasta, and then went to the fight out of shape. He was losing and embarrassed, so he kneed his opponent in the groin and lost by disqualification. <laughs> six years later, he's the heavyweight champion of the world. And it's a remarkable story. And to me, what really drew me about it was it's an immigrant story. Um, he was the son of an Italian uh, shoemaker who worked in the famous shoe factories of Brockton, Massachusetts. Um, he dropped out of high school. He didn't really have an alternative uh, other than boxing the, uh, to a life in the shoe factories, a life of drudgery that he dreaded. And so he pursued boxing as his way out, as a lot of immigrants do. You know, he grew up in the 1920s uh, when there was a lot of anti-immigration fervor in America, comparable to today. 
Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti were arrested on the Brockton streetcar a mile from Rocky's uh, grandfather's house. And he grew up in that era when Italians were really discriminated against. And then later, he becomes a heavyweight champion in post-war America. And he doesn't welcome this, but he's hailed as the great white hope because he's the first white boxing champion uh, since Joe Lewis had taken the crown uh, 15 years earlier during the Great Depression. And now he's a symbol of Cold War America and might and right. You know, his manager says he punches like the atomic bomb. He goes to the White House and meets uh, President Eisenhower. He's with, uh, you know, Joe DiMaggio. And so it's really this story about um, immigrants, you know. And when you look at boxing, it's always the people on the lower socioeconomic, uh, you know, rungs of the ladder who are fighting. You know, first you have the Jewish immigrants in the New York tenements in the early 1900s, and then the Irish, and then the Italian, and later black and Latino fighters. And now you see a lot of fighters from Eastern Europe and other places. Um, so that was fascinating to me. So between that childhood as the son of Italian immigrants and his fame as a boxer, he was in the army. Mm -hmm. and I, that was one of many, many passages in the book that I found fascinating that I think a lot of people don't know about in terms of his background. Talk a little about his army career, what, what he did and was he honorable or dishonorable or? Well, this was a remarkable discovery I made that had never been out there publicly. Right. Um, I got his army record from the National Archives. He, and the public story, because we, we put our, our sports heroes on pedestals and we don't really look, at, back in that era, um, in the 1950s, people didn't really do a lot of digging into the dirt that might have you know, inhabited the corners of their lives. And what I discovered, the public story, was that Rocky served in an army engineer unit during World War II that ferried supplies to Normandy during the D-Day invasion. And what I discovered when I got his army record was that he was not at Normandy. He was in a military stockade in England because he and another GI had been accused of uh, robbing and beating up two British civilians. And it was a fascinating case. I was able to get the court-martial transcript, his mug shots, and uh, they claimed that the two British civilians were gay and had propositioned them. The uh, court-martial uh, board did not buy that. And Mar Rocky was convicted and sentenced to seven years of hard labor. And he served, wow. uh, he came back stateside. And this was a two-year gap in his life that nobody ever knew about until I dug this up. And what's really interesting is that because he served two years in military prison, they reduced his sentence. Um, he came back stateside, and when the war ended in the spring of 45, he stayed in the Army until the end of 1946. And this really got his, his boxing career going because he was out at Fort Lewis, Washington in the Pacific Northwest. And he started boxing there, and he won. He made it to the finals of a national AAU junior championship. But he was so crude that he punched his opponent on the top of his head, shattered a knuckle. It could have been a career-ending injury but a Japanese-American surgeon whose family had been interned um, in the prison camps during World War II performed an experimental operation and saved his career. And right before this happened, there's a photo. I talked to the doctor. Dr. Thomas Takeda was the surgeon. And his sons, who were both Japanese-American doctors in California, talked to me. And they shared a photograph of Dwight Eisenhower, then the general, touring a Fort Lewis uh, hospital. And there's him with Dr. Takeda. And a few years later, there's that famous photo of Eisenhower at the White House holding up that same fist of Rockies that Dr. Takeda had, had repaired and hailing the new heavyweight champion of the world. That's a remarkable story. We, we always like to talk craft here. And, and this gets me uh, to a question I had when you started talking about the archives, mm -hmm. National Archives. Having dealt with archives myself and my work, it can be long, frustrating. Talk about the work that went into this book. I mean, this wasn't something that you did overnight or in a couple of days. Sounds no, like I, I worked a lot on of, a lot of work for about four years, but it was a labor of love. I loved what I wanted to do. I wanted to transport the reader back to New York in the 1950s, back to those smoke-filled arenas, back to those colorful characters and the intrigue, you know, the mafia attempting to fix the title fight when Rocky became the champion. And I wanted you to smell that smoke, and I wanted you to see those fights. And I made a conscious decision to really put the reader in the moment and not try to jump ahead in time and, and really recreate those fights and that atmosphere of the, uh, 
you know, the movie stars at ringside, the working class people. You know, this is a lost New York, a New York of factories and working class people. And then, you know, the, the, the glitz and excitement of fight night with all the celebrities. And, you know, like my editor um, said, you know, isn't it remarkable that there would be these fights, these spectacles at Yankee Stadium and they would fill up with people. And you'd have Humphrey Bogart, who was studying for his last movie role, The Harder They Fall, where he played an unscrupulous boxing promoter, was there. And you had Frank Sinatra um, was there. And you had all these people. And then you had, like, uh, Jimmy Cannon, the great sports writer, wrote about all the, you know, the criminals would flow up from the sewers and occupy the back seats. So it was just a great era and a great atmosphere. Well, you bring us to that era brilliantly, you know, scene by scene. It's, it's remarkable. Well, thank you. So Marciano finishes his career 49-0, and 0, mm -hmm. unbeaten. Yes. Put that in some sort of context in the, in the world of professional sports in particular. That's, that's pretty unheard of. And that's, that's what fascinated me about his story. And also, how many athletes can walk away at the top of their game? They stay too long. And Rocky, here's a guy, you know, his reputation, he's kind of unschooled, he's a high school dropout, but he has the presence of mind in a very savage sport um, where people are used and abused and left penniless and, you know, brain addled. He had the presence of mind to walk away at the top of his game. And the subtitle of my book was, is Rocky's fight for perfection in a crooked world. And what I'm alluding to is the mafia corruption that infiltrated boxing. We all know about mobsters and gangsters going back to Al Capone and Jack Dempsey. Um, but what happened, I discovered after World War II, was that television opened up the coffers to boxing and made it very lucrative. And the mafia really moved in and took institutional control of boxing. It was known as the octopus. And a notorious mobster named Frankie Carbo, who was known as the underworld commissioner of boxing, had been involved with Murder, Inc., um, at least five murders. And he secretly controlled and pulled the strings, and he controlled Rocky's career through his manager. Mm. And I found that Rocky had this conflict where he was a proud Italian-American. He kind of loved to hang out with these wise guys in retirement because it gave him the vicarious thrills that he was missing in the ring. And yet he hated that negative stigma that they put on Italian-Americans. And he had to deal with that throughout his career, and he had to navigate that and kind of you know, make a deal with the devil to get to the top. And he was good friends with the opera star, Mario Lanza. And I found this remarkable old uh, government intelligence report that had never been out there before, um, where he goes to visit Mario Lanza in his ho home in Beverly Hills. And a couple of wise guys come in, and they want to take over Mario Lanza's career, um, which was struggling. He was an actor and a singer in Hollywood. And they said, we can do for you what we did for Frank Sinatra. And Lanza gets really upset, and he punches one of the guys. And they leave, and Rocky is in the living room. And Rocky's very uncomfortable, and he says, you know, you got to watch out, you know, that guy is Tommy Three Fingers Brown. He's a notorious mobster, and uh, I know your frustration. I have to deal with the mob. They take half of my earnings, but you have to put up with it. So it was just really fascinating to me, that whole culture. Wow. So he dies that. tragically in an airplane crash in 1969. Uh, Yes, this is the 50th anniversary this year of his death. Was that the end of an era in terms of boxing? As, I as, think so. As it was once viewed and as we would now view it today? We're, we're, I think so. I mean, obviously, Muhammad Ali was a very charismatic right. figure um, who kind of gave it the last real breath, um, and certainly other prominent boxers, but certainly as being center stage in American life. And I was really drawn to Rocky's story. We, we start with him as a boy in the 1920s, and we go through all this. And now he's kind of like the, the Don Draper character in Mad Men. As the 60s in America and the world is changing, he's kind of drifting aimlessly. You know, he's wandering across America. He's doing deals with mobsters. He's involved with a loan shark. He's making public appearances. And he takes cash. And he's, he's walking around with bags of 50000 you know, $20,000 in cash. He stashes it in odd places. And uh, he's womanizing. And he really loses it himself. And he really... Um, in this America that's changing. And towards the end of his life, I found this remarkable bond that he had with Muhammad Ali. And this was when Ali was suspended, um, you know, for refusing to be drafted and fight in Vietnam. And he needed to make money, so he gets involved with this promoter who stages this hokey computer fight between uh, a 46-year-old or 45-year-old Rocky Marciano and Muhammad Ali. So you have this white conformist from the 50s and this black militant from the 60s. And they meet in Miami, and they go into a secret studio, and they spar for 70 rounds before the cameras. 
and they strike a surprising bond. And Rocky, I talked to Ali's wife at the time and Rocky's brother, who were both there, and they told me about these remarkable scenes where um, Ali, Rocky encourages Ali for the struggles he's going through and says, look, you're just different. My, my ancestors faced discrimination as Italians, and I know what you're going through, and hang in there. And one day, they're sitting by the side of the ring during a break, and they're sharing grapefruit slices. And they start talking about all the race riots in America in Watts, and they say, what if you and me, a white man and a black man, got on a bus and we rode into Watts and we rode into Detroit and we preached racial harmony? And Ali got really excited. He goes, would you do it? Would you do it? And Rocky was like, yeah, I would do it. And tragically, two weeks later, Rocky climbs into a oh, Cessna geez. plane in Chicago. Um, it's supposed to go home to Florida the next day to celebrate his birthday with his family, but he detours to Iowa to a mobster steakhouse opening, and the plane gets caught in heavy weather and crashes in a cornfield in Iowa. And Jim Murray, the great Los Angeles Times sports columnist, writes a column the next day and he says, start the count, he'll get up. A lot of us today are wishing there were an honest referee in a cornfield in Iowa. I want the movie. That's incredible. It is incredible. Uh, you know, we want to take a little time and talk to you about the hat you wear now at the University of Connecticut as a professor of journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want this opportunity to pass without talking to you about the industry as it exists and what you see for the future for your students and really for the country. I'm troubled but also hopeful for journalism. My students keep me energized. Um, they're really excited, they're passionate, they're talented, they care, and they're getting jobs. What I tell them is you're building the bridge to the future. People have always hungered for stories going back to the days of cave paintings. The technology always changes. I, there's one class where I teach the history of press in America, and I tell them to put away your devices, put away your computer, put away your phone, okay, put away your paper and your pencil. And there's none of these devices. We still have this universal desire to tell stories. Uh, my fear is twofold. On the national front, as we're heading into a new 2020 election, I worry about the horse race mentality of the television network's coverage. And we're starting to see it again in spite of the best of intentions. And it's not just Fox News, which literally has the president's ear and spills a lot of bile into it, and that's really destructive. But even CNN and the so-called liberal networks, they love the horse race. They love to have, like recently, there was a story about the environment and climate change. And there's this need to have this false equivalency of we're going to have a climate change denier on to balance it. That's like having someone on to say the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. So that troubles me. Um, is, the, is the horse race coverage, though, seems to be like it's driven really by it's really cheap to do. It's cheap you to do. You put a panel of people together in a studio in D.C. or New York, and you've got 40 minutes of coverage that you can just flog to death. Uh, that's for exactly the, the reason. Entire period. And that's why I fear it's not going to change. But you know, there's a saying you get what you pay for in terms of democracy. You know, when Donald Trump took off in the 2016 Republican primary, the, the, as an executive at CBS was saying, you know, this may not be good for democracy, but it's great for CBS and our bottom line. And that's what you're faced with. And on the local front, I worry that, you know, in spite of all the headwinds that journalists face today, I feel that there's good national journalism being done. There's the traditional outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe are re-energized. They're making money. There's groups like ProPublica. But on a local level, there's less people watching the store. There's less people at town halls and police departments and state houses. And, you know, there's not a viable business model to, to make that work. And that's troubling and that's concerning uh, to me. I, I share your hope in, in the younger generation of journalists. So your students are in their late teens and early 20s into their 20s. What do they tell you has attracted them to journalism? Why do they want to go into this? I mean, you've mentioned some of the pitfalls or potential pitfalls of an industry that in some sectors is shrinking. What do they tell you? Well, you have to follow your passion. You know, you can't just become an engineer because that's where the money is if that's not where your passion is. And they are drawn by a couple of things. They want to make a difference. They like the adrenaline rush of being a reporter. I mean, in a way, you're, you're a social crusader and you're a detective. So it's, it's a really fun job. And I tell them, you're not going to have to sit behind a desk. You're not going to have, mm. it's going to be different every day. And that's the adventure of it. Certainly in today's changing world technologically, I, we really push them to be multi-talented. We push them to you know, be triple threats, you know, you know, be able to write, be able to broadcast, be able to do television and radio and blogging. Um, you know, podcasting, which I worked on the Crime Town podcast, 
is a whole new medium that's attracting a lot of people. So people, you know, I, I look at my students and my own children, they're consuming news, they're consuming information, and there's a hunger for it. And I think that our media uh, moguls need to, to give them that. They need to give them what they want. And I think hopefully they are going to find it and the journalism students and the future journalists are going to invent it themselves. Do you give your students any advice about sort of operating in this environment where, you know, the President of the United States refers to the press as the enemy of the American people, mm -hmm. uh, dismisses entire, you know, uh, uh, bodies of coverage as fake news. Um, do you give any advice or insight to your students about operating in that kind of environment? Have a thick skin. I mean, certainly it's changed, <laughs> but advice, actually. even when I was a young reporter, you're always going to get people that don't like you. You're going to get people, if you're doing your job right, they're not going to like you, and they're going to put up resistance to you. I remember Buddy Cianci calling me a fiction writer and threatening to shut me out and sue me and bully me and harass me, but that, that goes with the territory, and you have to wear it as a badge of honor, and you have to, there's an old saying from an old commercial, never let them see you sweat, so don't let them realize that they're getting under your skin, even if they are. Be professional, understand it comes with the territory. In some ways, it's not personal. If anything, it's a pat on the back that you're doing a, a good job. So we've got literally about 15 seconds left, but we know you're working on a new project. Can you tell us 15 seconds worth of what it is? Raymond Patriarca, the former longtime mob boss of Providence. Another great story. To me, if you tell Raymond's story right, you tell the history of the mafia in America. He started in the 1920s guarding bootlegging shipments. He later rose to power, um, was involved in Las Vegas casinos with Frank Sinatra. Uh, he arbitrated disputes between New York's five families. Um, the CIA approached him about trying to get one of his hitmen to take out Fidel Castro. Um, he was called before Congress and for hearings, and he said, you know, the book The Godfather had come out. And he goes, you know, I could write my own book and call it The Patriarcha Papers, and it would be a bestseller. And you're writing that book, actually. There we got to go. leave it there. Uh, but he's Mike Stanton. The book is Unbeaten, Rocky Marciano's Fight for Perfection in a Crooked World. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, find us on Facebook and Twitter. He's Wayne. I'm Jim. We'll see you again next week for more Story in the Public Square.